Bench it, you can share it. Don't be shy. That's okay, you can, I mean, we can gab and we can just chill. Well, yeah, you know, I know how much you love. I think it's okay. Hello, everybody. Hi, Kendall. Hi. <laughs> hi. How are you? Okay, so hi, this is so exciting. We have a full crew here. Um, and the purpose of our class today is buyers and brews. So part of it was to drink brews, which I did. Everybody has proof I drank beer, right? Genuinely did. Classes. I was there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That I, want, I want you to fan out amongst your friends and family and let them know that I did, in fact, do beer. Um, second part of it is to give you an idea of what it takes to buy a house in this pretty, you know, competitive market that we're in. So this is not like a formal sort of a thing. So if you want to interrupt me with questions, heckle me. Go ahead, bring it on. It's cool. I can handle it. Um, but the first thing that I want to kind of get out is just like I just kind of wanted to get some truths out there that I thought buyers who might be thinking about buying and those who are dreaming about buying might be thinking. Okay, so here's the truth. Ready? There's no houses to buy, right? It's feeling like there's just not much out there. You might be feeling frustrated because there's no houses to buy. You might be thinking that all agents are the same, okay? Maybe you're thinking agents are generally self-motivated. They're not, they're not thinking about their clients. They're just thinking about what's in their pocket or how to get money in their pocket, right? Or perhaps you could be thinking, um, maybe you're thinking, I should buy with the listing agent. That's a truth that I hear out there. Maybe I should buy with the listing agent because I'll get a better deal or I'll get the house or I'll, or maybe they'll kick back their commission to me, right? So you might be thinking that. Another thing that a buyer could be thinking, and maybe this is one of your thoughts, is I think I should just rather shop on my own. I, I don't want to get pressured. I can see all the houses that are for sale. I, I don't want – I'll just do it on my own. I really prefer that. I feel better that way. Um, or one of the last thoughts that I thought you might be thinking is that how could I how could I possibly compete with the all cash offers that are out there? And it is true. There's a lot of cash buyers out there. Has anybody thought any of these things at any point? Yes? No? Yeah. Rachel's like telling the truth. Anthony's not willing to. It's cool. <laughs> you can say, yeah, I think all real estate agents are self-motivated. It's cool. <laughs> no? Everybody except me. Thank you, Anthony. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of wanted to just tell you some stories about, and this is going to sound like it's terrible, but I think that a lot of real estate agents like to tell you, that's what I said in my email, stories about unicorns and rainbows. And they like a price. Like, it's a great time to buy. Don't worry. I will make it so easy for you. There's wonderful homes that you can make lowball offers on and get them accepted. These are what I call unicorns and rainbow stories, and I don't think that the average consumer is buying it. I don't think anybody in this room actually buys it when a salesperson tries to share overly optimistic stories. So there's a couple of stories that have happened actually recently here at Diggs um, that can happen if you're not making great decisions and working with people that at least have all of the brain cells firing in sequence and has some experience, right? <laughs> okay, there's some laughing back there. It's true. Okay, have you not met a couple? I just like hearing that story. It's a very not nice thing. 
Well, I'm way too classy to say that there's some agents out there that are dumbasses. I would never say that, especially not on Facebook Live. I would never do that. That's bad channel talk. Yeah, no, 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 no. That would be, my mother would not approve, so I didn't say any of that. So, like, say, so, so here's a story. We had a situation where we actually represented the buyer, and she's in a very challenging price point. She wants to buy a house under $500,000. She needs two bathrooms. She needs it to be in habitable condition. Doesn't need to be beautiful, but she prefers that everything is in good working order, right? She wants a backyard, she wants a two-car garage. This is not a simple order anywhere in this area. Anybody who's looking for a house knows this is really, really tough. And we found her a house, and she made an offer, and there were multiple offers. And the counter offer came back, and it came back at a price that she could afford. She could afford easily, right? Okay, so one of two things can happen. You can actually sit there and say to the buyer, well, you'd better not only take this counter offer, but you should go higher than this counter offer because there's no houses for you to buy. And if you don't buy this one, who knows when you're gonna get the next house and interest rates might be higher. So your monthly payment is gonna be higher. You could have an agent that does that. And I, I tell me, I, I absolutely know that this buyer would have done it. If we had pressured her, she would have done it because she trusts us. She trusts that we're gonna tell her the truth, right? Or, we could have been agents who were thinking about making a quick sale because the truth of the matter is we don't know when the next house is going to come on the market that she can afford that 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 fits all of her little things that she needs to do right we don't know when that's going to happen we don't know what interest is going to be we don't know when we're going to get paid on this particular buyer right so if we weren't looking out for interest we could have probably very well talked her into this house but i could hear i could hear on the phone She's just not really sure she wants this house. I could hear that she was sitting there going, well, this is a huge compromise and it, it mostly works, but I don't know, I just, I guess this is what I have to do. And she would have done it, but I said, Ixnay, if you don't, if, if you're not willing to do this price, don't, don't buy this house at all. We'll wait. It's okay, you don't have to buy a house right now, right? Now I know that makes me sound really, really great, but it's not me so much as having somebody who is looking out after the long game as opposed to looking out after making a sale, right? So that's one story. Here's another story. Many buyers feel that the process of buying a home is all wrapped up in the shopping, and maybe if you're really thinking about it, it's all wrapped up in the negotiations. How am I gonna get my contract accepted? Or maybe you're thinking that the process is shopping, and negotiating and making sure that you're not gonna pay too much for the house, right? That you're not gonna find out later you were a patsy and you paid too high of a price for a house when you didn't have to or you shouldn't have or gosh only knows what you might be thinking, right? And I think that most buyers think that's what's really important, that, that front end, shopping for the house and then getting your offer accepted, that's not too hot. But there's a huge amount of stuff that happens after you get your contract accepted. Because it's not like you go to Nordstrom's and pick out a shirt you like and then take it to the cashier, pay your money and then out the door you go with a shirt, right? It's like, if you buy a house, you buy the house, you get your contract accepted, but there's this entire period of what we call due diligence. You gotta make sure you get your loan, you gotta make sure you get the appraises, you gotta make sure that the house is in good condition or at least the condition you expected it to be in. You wanna make sure that there isn't any legal problems or title problems or nasty disputes between one homeowner and another. There's a lot of stuff that needs to happen, right? And if you aren't working with an agent who's knowledgeable, who's trustworthy and is looking out after your interests, mistakes can happen. So here's an example. You're thinking, how hard could it be? It's a house, I just buy it, right? So here's an example of a mistake. One of the buyers, it was my listing actually, um, the buyer did their inspections and there was a bunch of air conditioning ducts that were underneath the house, right? And the buyer's agent gave us a request, remove air conditioning ducts, abandon air conditioning ducts. And my seller said, sure, I'll do that. Okay. They also were wrapped with what we what the inspector called an asbestos-like material. Didn't know if it was asbestos. They never asked us. They just asked us to remove the ducts. So my seller said, great, we'll remove the ducts. Well, we removed the ducts, and at the final walkthrough, the buyer said, 
so where's your certification that all the asbestos is gone? And we looked and went, what the what? You didn't ask us to remove asbestos. You asked us to remove the ducts. And the buyer's agent said, well, it was implied that we're getting the asbestos done. And I'm like, what the what? Long story short, the buyer bought the house, but they were super unhappy with their agent, and it cost them tens of thousands of dollars to remove the asbestos after the close of escrow. It was on the buyer's dime, not on the seller's dime. So that's a mistake that can happen because your language isn't expressing what you actually want to do. And these are fine points that can really damage your bottom line. Another one, this one just cracks me up. Um, a buyer's agent uh, put in an offer on one of our listings and they made the, they made the offer non-contingent on inspection. There's no contingency of inspection whatsoever. That's not completely unusual in our market. It's a really risky thing to do, right? It's a pretty ballsy thing to do, but that's what this agent did. And we found out later that the buyer had no idea what this meant and it was just... I'm going to go into the challenges. We did close escrow and the buyer has the property and everything was fine, but he had to close escrow because I was going to, we were going to get his money. We were going to get his earnest money deposit because he made the offer non-contingent. So these are things that can happen if you don't have an agent who A, knows what they're doing, and B, is looking out after your interests. I could go on and on and on with a bajillion different stories, but the purpose here isn't to scare you so much as to illustrate that there's a lot more to buying a house than just shopping on the internet portal of your choice, finding a really pretty one and putting it in your shopping cart and saying, check out. It's, <laughs> it's a little bit more than that, okay? All right. Um, the other reason that you would want to work with an agent that's really looking out after your interest is that you want choices. You want choices on what you inspect, how you inspect it, who will help you inspect it, right? You want choices on whether or not you have an inspection contingency. And if there isn't one, how you do this so that you aren't caught halfway through going, oh, shoot, I didn't, I didn't realize it was going to be like that. I, I didn't mean to do it. I'm sorry. I, I, I take it back. Um, oh, yeah. I wrote down here. I have notes. I almost never do notes, guys, but I have notes. Um, I wrote in here, choices on how you're counseled, right? Because are you going to have somebody that says, um, okay, oh, you, you, you saw two houses on Zillow? Okay, great. Let's go see the two houses. And then have the person say, well, which one do you want to make an offer on? Zillow's the worst. Yeah, Zillow's the worst. Yeah, so Zillow's not the worst. You just have to understand what it is. And we're going to go through what Zillow is because it's very, very useful, but you have to know what it is. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not a Zillow hater. I am not a I'm Zillow, Zillow. No, I'm, I'm. Well, I will just have to learn you, honey, on what Zillow is good for. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you for, for not hanging me you know, right there. <laughs> but if you have somebody who is understanding what you're doing, now I, I teach all of my agents, they're not supposed to ask just how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, and how big of a yard do you want. They're supposed to ask, what do you want this house to accomplish for you? Because there's nothing worse than telling your agent, I have to have three bedrooms and two bathrooms for the agent to not ask really good questions and for you to miss out on a house that would be awesome for you because it had two bedrooms and two bathrooms and an incredible off, uh, 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 guest house that would have been your third bedroom because you wanted the third bedroom for your home office. You didn't actually need it as a bedroom. Mother -in your mother, yeah, <laughs> your mother-in-law is awesome. Okay, yeah, I like your mother-in-law a lot. Anyway, so that's that's like counseling, right? If somebody doesn't ask questions and go really deep with what's going on, you could miss on a perfect house just because it doesn't have a set picture, okay? Um, and the last thing that I wrote down about what agent, an agent that's dedicated to you might do is that we're networking. Now, most of you out there have to network in some capacity for your job, right? You gotta, you gotta get out there and make the business happen, meet the clients, meet the patients, meet all kinds of people, you gotta network, right? 
We do networking for houses and we do it on a regular basis. This is, this is our full-time job. You've got a full-time job. This is our full-time job. And what does that mean to you? What that means to you is that a house is networking. Sorry, I get distracted. <laughs> so what that means to you is like, what that means to you is that, for example, there are houses that are currently in escrow right this minute. You can't make an offer on them right now because somebody else has already got dibs, right? They've already put dibs on it. They're in, they're in escrow. But escrows can fall apart, right? Maybe the loan doesn't come through. They don't qualify for their loan. Or maybe they found something about the house that they didn't like because uh, they're Chinese and they found out that the feng shui was really, really bad, but you're not Chinese and you couldn't give a rat's patootie about the feng shui, right? So let's say the first buyer is Chinese. They're going to exit out of the contract because they don't like the feng shui. If I could tell you about that before the contract falls apart because of my networking with other agents, Ah, she says, see the light go on. Then you might be able to buy the house in that gap before it actually goes on the market. That's what networking does. We're out there talking to agents and clients. We're knocking on doors. My mommies are the best mommies. They are, and everyone knows that mommies know everything that's going on in the neighborhood. Am I right or am I right? Absolutely. Yeah, mommies rule. <laughs> if you don't know that mommies rule, you're sadly mistaken. Okay, so my mommies know what's going on in the neighborhood and they have their finger on the pulse and we know who's going to be moving, who's going to be doing what, and we can give you that, that heads up. Okay, so that's what an agent dedicated to you. Now, can you do that on your own? Can you do that on your own? Can you do networking? Maybe you have kids in school and you've got the mommy network. Only one elementary school, but that's beside the point. I have like three or four, but that's beside the point. <laughs> or five, or six. Not going to take, no, exactly. We talk about that. So, right, can you do that on your own? Yes, you can, but unless you're going to do it full time like we do, and unless you have six other agents that are also doing that, it's not going to be as effective as what we can handle here. So, let's get into the meat. That was kind of like the setting the stage because why would you even listen to a real estate agent's buyer, home buyer workshop? if you didn't have some inkling of what was going on and why there would be a benefit, okay? So, let's talk about how do you buy a house. So the first thing that people usually wanna find out about is how do you find a house? If you've been looking at all, and I know some of you have, some of you haven't, there's not a lot of for sale signs in the yard, and when you're looking on your internet portal of choice, there's not that many choices. I can tell you that in the city of La Crescenta, as of today, there are 35 homes on the market for sale. 35. There are 20,000 housing units in the city of La Crescenta, and there are 35 homes for sale. That is appalling. It's less than one month's worth of inventory. So very, very, very small. So how do you find these? So now we will answer Tiffany's question about Scylla. <laughs> right? So we all know that the easiest way to look for houses is on the internet. I look on the internet. You look on the internet, right? That's where houses are easiest, most easy to be found. Um, and there are, there's probably 350 different websites that you can use to find a house. But the big three are going to be Zillow, Redfin, and Realtor.com. Those are your big three, right? And there are differences between three. Here's the most important difference. Zillow does not have a brokerage license, okay? What does that mean? It means that Zillow is a third party. So what happens is I take the listing and I load it up onto the multiple list. That's our first stage, right? The second stage, it, well, I'm the first stage, but MLS is the second stage. The third stage would be portals like Zillow, okay? So since they're getting it essentially third hand, second hand if you want to be really nice, they're getting it, it takes longer for you to see it when it goes on Zillow. Right, so by the time you see it on Zillow, all the realtors have already seen it. That's by design, by the way. It's on purpose. We're not dumb. <clears throat> and, um, and Zillow will also allow people to put listings on that aren't on the multiple list. Plus, Zillow will add on to their database things that are in pre-foreclosure. What's pre-foreclosure? Pre-foreclosure means that a homeowner maybe missed only one payment, 
That does not mean that there's going to be a distress sale. That does not mean that a moving truck is going to happen in the middle of the night and they take off with all their bills and now you can scoop up an amazing bargain in California real estate. It just means that a homeowner missed maybe as little as one payment. But Zillow will put that on their website. So when you're when you're looking on Zillow, by the way, this morning, La Crescenta on the multiple list, there are 35 homes available for sale in La Crescenta according to the multiple list. You want to know how many Zillow said? 48. Are there 48 homes for sale in, in the city of La Crescenta? No. Does this mean, now you might be thinking, well, it's better to go to a website that has more than less, right? I'd rather some more homes for sale. Maybe I'll get lucky. You never know. You never know if you're going to win the lotto either. Here's the thing. If you see a house that is actually a pre-foreclosure, which I've just explained to you, isn't actually for sale, isn't actually something that you could buy, and it is listed at, let's just pick a number out of the sky. Let's say it's 600000 Now you've got it in your head that you can buy a house in La Crescenta for 600000 And i got to tell you, no, you cannot, at least not a house that big. At some level, this is going to affect what you think real estate is worth. So when you see a real house that's actually for sale, that's now listed at 650, at some level you're thinking, that's too high. I won't pay that price. Well, what that could actually mean is that you will get priced out of this market because while you're waiting for the listing that's never gonna happen at 600,000, because it wasn't a real listing to begin with on Zillow, you will pass by on this very real priced home at 650, and then interest rates go up and prices go up, and now you can't afford to buy in La Persona at all. Okay, so that's my caution on Zillow. Where is Zillow useful? Zillow is extremely useful when you are still in the education, entertainment, I'm just casually interested, I kind of want to check out what's going on in the marketplace. Real estate porn. It's real estate porn. <laughs> Although I would actually recommend Swipe for that, which is an app. <laughs> Swipe is awesome for real estate porn. <laughs> Gotta love it. Huh? Question? No. Oh, okay. Although I, I found that when you're on Zillow and looking at a house that is it's really for sale, but you actually lie, it's like falling in love with somebody that you engaged to be married. Yeah. And then you're just like, oh, ah. So I don't know if any of you can hear that on Facebook Live, but Melissa said was actually super, super accurate. Falling in love with a house on Zillow that's not actually for sale is kind of like falling in love with a married man, but he didn't tell you you were married, and then you get all your hopes up and stuff. And then when you find out he's not available, your heart's crushed. And it actually makes the next guy that comes along that's perfectly available look, look not so hot which is really kind of tragic when you think about it. So anyway, um, <laughs> so one of the things that I wanted to recommend is that here at Digs, we actually have an invitation-only searchable app that is better than Realtor.com, Redfin, anything that you can get that's publicly available. Um, and it's better for a couple of different reasons. One, it gives you side-by-side -side comparison. Who loves to do side-by-side -side shopping on the internet? Like on Amazon or CNET or whatever? I love side-by-side, -side, right? Wouldn't it be so cool if you could take like the three top houses and just go side-by-side -side their kitchens, side-by-side -side their bathrooms, side-by-side -side their, their backyards? That would be so hot, right? Okay, well, you can do that on our app. Um, another thing you can do on our app, which is super cool, is you can say, look, I want you to put a higher priority on listings that are within walking distance of, of Trader Joe's, or close to coffee, or you know within a certain distance of a preferred elementary school, something like that. Yeah, it's super cool. Or you could even say, I want, I want open floor plan kitchen, right? Which is not on the multiple list. I also have to say that your search app is more mobile friendly yes. than almost any other yeah, it was mobile first. app that I've used. Yes. It was mobile it's first. Mobile you want that, Tiffany? I'll give you an invitation. Everybody that's here, everybody that's here, you'll get a follow-up email from me and you'll get all of these resources in email. Anybody that's on Facebook Live, if you would like an email with these resources, like an invitation to our invitation-only search app, be delighted to send that to you. Just drop me a private message or put it right on there with your email address and we'll send it right along. No stalking, no craziness, I promise, because I suck at stalking. Loans, let's talk about loans, okay? So a lot of people ask me, I bank at bank of choice, mm -hmm. and I think I should get my loan from there. 
Okay, so that's what we call a direct lender. An example of that would be Bank of America, Chase, Citibank, uh, Wells Fargo, those are all direct lenders. And that's one way of getting a loan. I will tell you though, that just because you have your bank accounts at Bank of America gives you absolutely no advantage. I don't even care if you're, I don't even care if you're some rich dude. It just, it's, it's just, the one hand doesn't talk to the other. So you're going to be in the same boat as if you went with anybody else. Okay. So that's a direct lender. Um, the other way to go is with an internet lender, like say Quicken Loans or Rocket Mortgage or whatever is out there. And then your third choice is going to be your mortgage broker, mortgage banker. Okay. So what are the differences? Well, to you actually, it shouldn't be too much difference. There might be some differences in how much you can do online. There might be a few differences in terms of the process, but the actual loan program that you get, the interest rate that you get, the fees that you pay should be more or less the same. Okay. If they're significantly lower, um, you should ask questions because if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. There's a couple of exceptions to that. Uh, one exception is every once in a while, you will find a credit union who got a whole bunch of money or they have a whole bunch of money that came mature and they're not quite sure how they want to invest it and their board will, will decide that for a very short time period, they'll do essentially a mortgage loan sale and they'll do a really attractive loan. And that's like, find, that's like winning the lotto, you'll find that. And that does happen, it's just really hard to find it, okay? So that's the one exception. My opinion is that you should go ahead and shop, go to your bank, wherever you have your checking account, go to your credit union, wherever that is, shop online, whatever it is you like, find out what the rates are, and then go to a mortgage broker slash banker. Greetings. Would you like to come over here? You wanna sit next to me? <laughs> I'm a mascot. Um, <laughs> so go to, the, go, to, go to a mortgage banker that has a really kick-ass reputation in the area that you want to buy. Because here's the thing, doesn't really that ma much matter much to you as long as you get the same kind of loan. However, just like real estate agents have varying degrees of ability to get their shit done well, without chaos and on time, same with lenders. Okay, so for you, if it's your uncle, and well, we know what your uncle does, but let's say you have a cousin that does mortgages, okay? You might want to do stuff with your cousin, and your cousin's like, yeah, I'm going to give you a great job, I'm going to do a great job. And they probably are really, really eager. And you know your cousin, you know he's like National Merit Scholar, and he's the smartest dude you've ever known, and you've never known anybody to work so hard, and you just know your cousin is going to do a kick-ass job. But then you put, a, put an offer on one of my listings, and I'm like, so I'm going to call this guy and I'm going to say, so how long have you been doing this? What do you know? And I'm going to quiz him up one side, down the other, six ways to Sunday. And at the end, he's going to be crying because I'm that mean. <laughs> and if I, I am that mean. Mortgage brokers are, 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 are feared of me. But <laughs> awesome of them. Um, and if, if I'm not, at the end of that, if I don't think the mortgage banker that is attached to you can get the job done, I might try to steer the deal away from you. I really will. Okay. So you want a mortgage broker, banker that has a reputation that all the listing agents recognize and respect. Because if you do, it's going to be a lot easier for you. Yes, Emily. What about FHA loans? Oh, golly gee, will occurs. Okay. Um, I'm going to get to the next one on down payment. Okay. So down payment. A lot of people want to know about payment. Tiffany. It's only one your credit once, right? Because if you keep running it when you're shopping it, Depends on who you talk to on that one. A lot of a lot of mortgage people have told me that Congress told them they had to actually change the algorithm because it was essentially penalizing the consumer for shopping for a better rate. So it is my understanding that if they do it within a concerted time period, which is like three months, that additional credit dings do not count against you. However, I am not a mortgage professional. I just play one on TV. Make sure that you talk to a mortgage professional that you trust to verify that what I'm saying is accurate according to your mortgage broker. Okay. All right. So let's talk about down payment and source of down payment because we live in California 
the average price point right now in in, in uh, Lacrosin is seven hundred and thirty two, I believe, which is I know I know it's crazy. It made a huge jump last quarter. So um, that is a lot of moolah for a down payment. There's a lot of money, and so many people are wondering how the heck am I going to get a down payment? How much down payment do I actually need? All right, so. The conventional down payment that people expect that a listing agent such as myself would want to see is 20% down payment. 20% to 500,000, which is not even doable, but if it's a 500,000, it is how much money? Mm -hmm. Tiffany? I was nervous. <laughs> 100 smackaroos. 100,000 smackaroos. That is a lot of shekels. Yeah, that's okay. That's for young spot. I'm sorry, honey. Um, that is a lot. Yeah, it's not mine either, and I'm Chinese, but we don't go there either. So $100,000 for a $500,000, so I can find a $500,000 house for you to buy, okay? How are you going to put that much money together, um, and can you do it? Now, there's a lot of different ways to do it. In my opinion, if you don't have it yourself, the first place I would go is the bank of mom and dad. And you're like, no, 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 I don't want my parents to have a say on what I do. I understand. Get over it. The other part of it is, no, 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 no. My parents are batshit crazy. I don't want to get involved in that. I, I can't say anything about that one. But think about it this way. If your parents are really conservative and they've got their money in a bank account, a CD, a money market, whatever, they're getting at best 1.5% interest, maybe 2 wouldn't it be better for your parents' financial picture if they were to lend the money to you and you were to pay them, it's not something. It's, it's it's something that's a family arrangement. It's not a formal arrangement that is recorded. That's why this is Bank of Mom and Dad, and not do and not Cousin Guido. Okay, but Bank of Mom and Dad, you get a loan from Bank of Mom and Dad. They could potentially get a better return on their investment than what they're getting in the bank, and they can help their dear progeny launch into life and get out of their basement. Win-win, in my opinion, as well as get their lives started. So don't turn your back on the bank of mom and dad is what I'm really, really saying. Yes? What about other down payment options like the county? Like, well, I was actually going to get to that. Emily, <laughs> would you like to teach this? I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, but I first have to ask your FHA question. Okay. So what I was going to do is the other part that you can do is that many of you can borrow against your 401k and use that as down payment. Please check with your human resources department to find out what the requirements are on that, but essentially you're borrowing from yourself in order to get your down payment. So those are the two most common types of down payments. Some of you, that's not gonna be an option even with that. There are uh, loan programs that allow you to do less than 20% down. You can do 10% down or even as low as 5% down with a loan called the FHA. FHA is a government underwritten loan. I'm not going to get into the, the, the mechanics of it too much right now, but it allows you to buy with a much lower down payment and a much lower credit score. Okay, so that's important for a lot of people. Just understand that in the market conditions that we're in right now, an FHA is a very, very difficult loan to be accepted. And you're going to wonder, why would the seller care? As long as I'm giving them the price that they want, why do they care if I'm putting a smaller down payment or using an FHA loan? They care because, like I said, there's 30 days or 45 days of due diligence. And if you can't get your loan formally approved at the end of that, then we don't have a deal and the seller's going to have to go buy it, find another buyer. So they care because they want to make sure you're going to be able to cross the finish line and close escrow. Okay, so let's talk about down payment sources. One of the resources you will get in the email from me is a link to a company that has an exhaustive list of all of the down payment and home buyer programs that are offered by various and sundry governments, governments, community organizations, private organizations. There are things, there are special loans for doctors, special loans for firemen, for teachers, there's special loans for veterans, there are down payment assistant programs, there are grant programs for communities. There is 388 programs in the state of California 
that are available to home buyers to help them buy homes in, in all kinds of different ways with down payment assistance, with you know, qualify for a loan, with grants, with you know, lower credit scores. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Okay, so I will give you the link to that in our follow up email. And again, anyone on Facebook Live, you want that email, just PM me and give me your email address. I'm happy to send that out, out to you. The one thing that I do have to say about all of these programs is that these programs are all very, very difficult to use in our town because our prices are too high. Most of us actually make too much money. And even if you are in that narrow slice that qualifies, that will work, the home seller will likely not want to take your offer with these special programs because they're ignorant. And ignorance breeds fear, and fear means offer not accepted. But this market will not last forever, and it's, it behooves you. Some of you aren't ready to buy a house today. So it's a really good idea to familiarize yourself with the programs that are out there so that if the market changes by the time you are ready to buy, you will be armed with the knowledge of the resources that might be out there to help you. Yes, Emily. If you have an existing... Were you that student in every class? Yes. Okay. I Just absolutely curious. was. Front row, everything. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Emily. If you have an existing home and you're looking at buying an income property or buying a second home, can you borrow equity against your existing home? You can borrow equity against an existing home that you have. Um, the debt is going to count against you. So the banks want to know how much do you make and how much do you owe, right? So if you have a home and you owe, say, $5 on this home, and you want to take $200,000 out, you know, equity, now you owe $205,000 on this home, and then you're gonna go buy a second home and you're gonna borrow another $300,000, right? So you owe $200,000 over here and $300,000 over here, the bank's gonna wanna know that you can afford to carry the mortgage on both the two hundred dollars and the five hundred. dollars okay? So that's really important. So it's all gonna come out in the wash, as it were. The other thing that you might want to know, you didn't ask this question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Okay. FHA program can be used to buy investment property and second homes. Okay, So if you want to buy homes in an area that isn't as competitive as here, that could be an, a possibility. And anywhere that you want to buy, I have a real estate friend, agent friend. Seriously, I have friends everywhere, and they're all super awesome. So just tell me where you want to buy. I'll hook you up with somebody awesome. Okay. Um, that's down payment. Um, oh, okay. I wrote down in here. How do we compete with cash? If you are in the lower price ranges, and in this town, anything under seven fifty is considered lower price range. One to three quarters of a million. Isn't that fun? You know, Rachel's like she's shaking her head. It's like yeah, it's crazy pants. Um, so anything, if you want to compete in the lower price ranges, the chances that there is going to be someone who has all cash or something like all cash, like they've removed all their loan contingencies, it's going to happen. I mean, that's just that, especially if you're closer to five, it's going to happen. How can you compete? There's a zillion different ways that you can compete. I mean, money at the end of the day is the most important thing. And if you get outbid by somebody with all cash and they have a higher offer, Generally, there's not much that you can do about it, but there are a lot of incremental things that you can do that can help you at least be on even footing with an all cash offer, and in some cases, even get you ahead of an all cash offer. Now, I'm going to go through all of these because it'll take us too long. So, again, these are things that we do in our buyer consultations with your digs buyer's agent if this is something you want to do, but we can teach you how you can best compete with people who have a lot more money than you do. That's just that is the bald way of putting it. But one of the ways that you can compete is you compete by doing so much homework on your loan that you can make an offer without a loan contingency. Very risky. And as your representative, I'm never going to tell you that you should do that. Okay. However, if you decide that you want to compete with an all-cash offer, this is something you could do, in which case we work very, very hard before you actually find a house that you want to buy so that you could do a no loan contingency offer with as little risk as possible and you would understand what the risk is so that at least you're not going to get blindsided. Okay, so that's just one little thing that you could do. Nikki John, hi. Okay. Um, so that's competing with cash. Last thing that I wanted to talk about is how are you protected? 
Okay, so when you find a house that you love, you're going to be making an offer, you have to fill out a legal contract. That legal contract has eight pages, and that's just the contract. There's a bunch of other paperwork that goes behind that. What's in that contract? The three things that is most important, okay, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of legalese, there's a lot of stuff that's in there. When you work with a digs agent, we actually go through every single thing in that contract so you understand it. I don't like people to sign contracts, they don't know what's in it. Okay, I, I just think that's common sense. But the three biggies on the contract, is there are three big contingencies that are in there to protect you from having made a bad decision with incomplete information. The first contingency is your loan contingency, okay? Most of you are going to get a loan if you're gonna buy a house, so we wanna make sure that's there. So just in case, maybe, maybe there's a divorce that you forgot to tell us about, <laughs> and it comes up in some you know, legal documents, and oh gosh, your husband that's not actually an ex-husband is in Paraguay, and I can't find him, so we can't get a quick claim, and sorry, your loan's gonna be denied you know, California. So if some unpleasant surprise comes up like that, you would be protected if there was a loan contingency. Your second contingency is the appraisal contingency. So you're going to, you're, you're, <laughs> whoa, streaker. You're going to make an offer on a property, um, and you're gonna make the offer, let's just say it's $500,000, okay? You're gonna make an offer of $500,000, you're gonna put 20% down, Loan's gonna, the, the bank is gonna give you a loan for the remaining 80%, right? All right. So let's just say that that house doesn't appraise for $500,000, it appraises for $450,000. As a $50,000 gap, what happens? One of two things, well, one of two things are a compromise. Either you are going to increase your down payment by $50,000, or the homeowner is gonna to have to lower their sales price by $50,000, or you compromise somewhere in the middle. You bring a little more money to the pot, they, raise, they, they lower the price a little bit, okay? But if you can't come to an agreement, then if you have an appraisal contingency, you no longer have to go forward with the contract. No penalty, for the most part, okay? The third contingency is the biggest one, and that is something called the inspection contingency. And the inspection contingency is huge. It's not just having a, a general contractor go to the house and look above, be below and above and around and, and through. This is everything you can think of from the legal documents to the, who owns the property, to whether or not there's easements, what's going on in the neighborhood, is there any, is there any toxic waste dump in the backyard? I mean, it's everything that you can think of. Asbestos, radon gas, lead, Wild. mold, <laughs> uh, red-legged frogs living in the backyard, which is a protected species. Then you can't, never mind. We'll go there. Everything, whether or not you know your your family feng shui guy comes and blesses the house and says it's facing the right direction for the date that you were born. Everything, okay, everything. And if the property does not inspect to what you thought it was going to be when you made the offer. Again, you're protected. Now, when you work with a digs agent, we try really, really hard to point all that stuff out to you before you ever make the offer. We're that, we're that really weird real estate agent that's walking around going, did you see that crack over there? It, it, it looks like it moved. You know, that could be a foundation problem. You better watch out there. We're those people. We're strange. But we figure it's better if we tell you about it before you make the offer than to spend a whole bunch of money on inspections, find out there's a crack in the foundation that was really obvious, it's just your first time buyer, you didn't know that, and now you've lost a thousand bucks on inspections and you know how to house. Why not tell you about it to begin with, right? So we're that type, and those are the protections are in the contract. So that was kind of just the overview of what's going on. Um, in the email that you'll get back from me, you'll get the invitation to the home search, You'll get uh, the names and phone numbers of two of the lenders that we really like working with right now. They're awesome, and they have that reputation that I'm looking for, right? Um, and then the third thing is, what did I say the third thing was gonna be? I can't remember, I wrote it down. Well, it's really valuable, you're gonna need it. <laughs> there you go. Any questions besides Emily, because she's asked all of hers. Huh? I said yeah, two sets of each, uh, three actually. I tried like the dark one and two of those light one things. I thought it would get better with age. IPA is stronger. That, did, is there more than one light one? Yeah. I think there's two yeah, IPAs. Yeah, there's there's a double IPA out there. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions?
No, any questions on Facebook? Wait, there's a lot of people that have joined. No questions on, okay, cool. All right, so I, that's it. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Drink beer. Thank you. Thank you for coming back. Anybody on Facebook, like I said, just send me an email or, or a private message with your email address. Happy to get you that package over. It's been fun, guys. Talk to you later. <laughs>